There is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Though the body is dead, the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will give you life in your human bodies through his spirit. Greetings from Goodson Chapel of Duke Divinity School. Patsy and I have really enjoyed worshiping here at the cathedral with you in these past Sundays. We've been here since Holy Week and we are deeply grateful for the staff, the leadership of this grand church and its competence and care during these past Sundays. Now, the last time that I preached here at the cathedral, uh, a fellow tourist emerged after the service and said, you were so depressing. I hope you're never invited back. Well, I'm back. And this time I so want not to be depressing. But let's face it, these past months, we have been in a depressing dialogue, a depressing dialogue with death. Oh, we, we began the year well. We, we said, we're in control. Uh, we're making progress. Uh, we're doing fine. Thank you. Just on our own. We're okay. And then by March, the, the virus, uh, and we had to say, well, the White House is clueless, but maybe the government will get its act together. Uh, maybe we can, we can beat this thing. And about March, I started to hear that voice. Your cheery claims of human self-sufficiency and potency sound silly. Death said, now I'm in charge. Now you think as a pastor, I, I guess I've done a thousand funerals in my time, you think as a pastor I would be more adept at talking back to death. Uh, this theological thanatologist uh, should be able to, to come up with an adequate word uh, to respond to death's doings. You, you'd, I'm a septuagenarian. I ought to know more about mortality than you kids. But even I have found it hard to find the words to turn on the evening news and to see death's haggard face staring back at me. The body bags in Mexico City or Monrovia or Manhattan. We've put everything we've got, our whole lives, into this little business, she said. It's mine now, said the one with the hourglass and the scythe. A hundred thousand by, by the end of May? Uh, they don't call me the Grim Reaper for nothing. Go ahead. Put your knee on the man's neck. Oh. There's a scuffle at the entrance to the store. The president tells me I don't have to wear a mask. You can't make me wear that mask. The owner of the store says, if you're so selfish, you don't care about the well-being of my employees, you can get out of here. And he said, thanks to you both for your efforts. I I'll take it from here. Oh. Since me and my buddy COVID-19 got to town, Oh, we're in charge. We attempted to respond. We can lick this, we said. We're making progress. Uh, we're all in this together. And death says, read the numbers. No, 
You think George and Ahmad and Rashad and Brianna, you think their deaths were accidents? Oh, death says, I take out 100,000 of your fellow citizens. You call out the troops, you tear gas, your own people. <laughs> and all you've got is a bunch of sentimental, sappy bromides. She'll live on in our memories, we say. But, but that doesn't make up for the family that says in their grief, we'll never hear mama laugh ever again. Oh, Ernest Becker was right. A conquering death smirks to us. Uh, uh, do your accomplishments, accumulate all your stuff, build your big buildings, publish a book, but in the end, I'll have the last word. Gotcha. Life's little losses add up to the great big rip off. As Paul put it in this Sunday's epistle, the body, the human body is dead. Oh, we, we strut about talking about our competence. And a little microscopic cell, first cousin of the common cold, comes into town to teach us a truth that the church tried to teach us here on Ash Wednesday. You are dust, and to dust ye shall return. And I so wanted not to be depressing. Paul says, Christians do not grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve, yes, death is real, a cause of grief, yes, but not without hope. Well, where is our hope in the face of death's dark dealing? I know where hope is not. Hope is not in our human strategies. Nothing human is a match for death. And in the face of that, Christians make a brash claim. In Jesus Christ, God has done in death. Jesus stood up to hate. In his ministry, he thumbed his nose at governmental and military tyranny. He stood beside the victims. He became a victim himself. Jesus Christ spoke a word to the principalities and powers. And then in one last decisive move, he defeated death. He did what we cannot. Paul says, when it comes down to it, as it will for us all, even those of you who are not as ancient as I, when it comes down to it, the final enemy is death. Jesus Christ is God doing something about death. The Christian faith begins in the cemetery. The women go out to the cemetery while it was still dark. They are shocked. The stone has been rolled away from the tomb. There's this impudent angel sitting atop the, the stone. The angel says to the women, Oh, you're looking for Jesus? I'm sorry. It just missed him again. Oh, by this time he's out in Galilee. By this time, there you will see him. The women said to themselves, Well, maybe this thing between us and God is not over. It's... Maybe it's just beginning. That very night, the disciples were hunkered down like a bunch of frightened rabbits behind locked doors. The stranger came, kicked in the door, stood among them, showed them his hands in his side, and 
and spoke to them, peace, receive my Holy Spirit, do what I did. And his clueless disciples said, well, we, we, thought, we thought that was, we thought death had the last word. And they exploded out into the whole world with a message. Crucified Jesus has been raised from the dead. They spread out into the world with his word. Because I live, you shall live. Oh, death. Death is real. It is terrible. The final foe. And death has been done in by Jesus Christ. That's how Christians can be so brutally honest about death. And at the same time so defiant, death has been defeated. That claim, that claim is, is why Christians founded the first hospital. It's our little death-defying act. Uh, th that's why uh, on the way in the ambulance to the hospital, she said to the attendant, young man, I want you to promise me that if there's a shortage of ventilators, my ventilator will be given to someone younger than I. I'm okay about the future. That's why on uh, the Sunday after George Lloyd's funeral, that's why in the cathedral, Amani Grace Cooper stood up and she sang defiantly. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. That's why when a few weeks ago somebody asked me, do you ever think there's any hope for America overcoming our long-term epidemic of white racial violence? I said, you know, Knowing American history since 1619, uh, no, I, I don't think there's much hope. And then I, I heard God whisper, after crucified Jesus was raised, you don't know what's impossible, do you? Oh. Some of you, by the way you have conducted yourselves in these past weeks, standing up to death, whether it's death's minions of COVID-19 or white racial violence, some of you have shown that what was said in the cathedral on Easter morning happens to be true. He is raised, he is risen, he is risen indeed. The God who raised, crucified Jesus from the dead promises, I'll bring you along into eternity. In love, the same Jesus who reaches out to us so resourcefully in life reaches out to us in death. Jesus Christ refuses to be raised alone. You know, from what I've seen as a pastor, at the at time of death, the main grief people feel is grief at the loss of relationship. They grieve for the loss of family, of friends, or, or work, the loss of relationship. 
But in Jesus Christ, God has the last word. The God who has shown so much determination to be in relationship with you continues in life, in death, in any life beyond death. This is our hope. And if it's not true, then as far as I know, we are indeed hopeless. I was there. I was there when he got the diagnosis. Uh, oh, we grieved over that. Preacher, he pled, please. Don't let him in. Don't let him have me. I'm not ready to go. So I dutifully took up my post at the door. I, I locked the door. I didn't let anybody in except medical personnel, a few family and friends. Family and friends helped me. We leaned against the door. But two weeks later, the doctor came in and said, I'm sorry. And I heard him whisper, step aside. I'll take over from here. Preacher, he said, bolt the door. I put my weight against the door. Everybody, we leaned against the door. And then one night he lost ground, gasping, and the door was cracked open despite our efforts. Now there was a hissing whisper from the other side. Step away, you church people. Step away from the door. He is mine now. No, we said. We leaned against the door. No. But at sunrise, I was surprised when he greeted me with a smile. And he said weakly, but uh, defiantly, you know, lying here, I, I've had a lot of time to think. And I've thought back over my life. I've, I've thought back over those times when I wasn't thinking about God. But it turns out, God was thinking about me. And uh, I think about all those times when God just showed up uninvited. And I'm thinking, if Jesus has gone to all that trouble to be with me, I'm thinking he ain't going to let a little thing like my dying stump him. Live or die. <laughs> I kind of think I'm owned by Jesus. And I heard death sigh. I heard him trudge down that hospital hall. I heard the door slam behind him. Death's hands empty, just robbed of his great trophy. Okay, listen up. This is going to be on the final exam. And it's probably my last trip to the cathedral. Uh, let Paul tell you your last best hope. If the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, that one who raised Christ from the dead will give you life in your human bodies. Or, as Paul put it elsewhere, whether we live or die, we belong to God. Amen.